Welcome to Presence, a global conversation for Newark. And hello, everybody. I am Doug, and I am back again. So happy to be with you. I hope everything's going okay in your world today. I'm continuing this series that began with the focus on the word regeneration used by both Jesus and Paul. And today I'm going to continue to talk about some very, very, a very disturbing subject. I'm going to talk about the love and acceptance of God. Okay, that was a little sarcastic. Love and acceptance of God, however, has been the problem that the biblical narrative has addressed it to great extent and to great length, beginning all the way back in the first century. And I've been talking about the writings of Paul, the teachings of Jesus, the other apostles as well, of course. With regard to how in the world do we sort this out, this idea of identity with regard to a genealogy, and we're reminded by Paul that, well, when you're looking at your genealogy, just remember, it's going to result in one of two identities, because there's only two identities in the story. One identity, Paul says, is, is after the flesh, and it's going to apply to the self or the human as the source of identity, and the other is after the Spirit, and that's where God and Spirit are the genealogical ancestry from which identity comes. And this brings up a whole conversation that we're getting into, and I'm going to get into more depth today, that has to do with where you are right now, whatever country you're living in, and as you personally look at world events, and you look at all the challenges that we have as humans on this planet today, this discussion of Paul with the, with the Gentiles is at the very heart of all these problems. And I'm going to suggest in very surprising ways, both to the Gentiles of the first century and what I think we're about to discover as we discuss these same issues today. So, how did God as source become the reality of a new identity and a new creation? Paul constantly reminded the Gentiles of the differences between the two, and he, of course, starts with the foundation of the story of identity with regard to the Gentiles' following of Jesus. And so the question is, what, what is the role and function of Jesus in this story of identity? Because it's going to bring us down to today, and the question is, that of Jesus' identity. Well, Paul starts by saying to the Romans, look, we need to understand this about Jesus' identity. Here's how it starts, folks. Paul says, Jesus, in Romans 1, this is right in the first few verses of Romans 1, he says, Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh. Huh, Okay. Jesus is initially identified according to the flesh. Remember, there's only two identities, after the flesh and after the spirit. The initial identifying of Jesus of Nazareth was after the flesh. And note that Paul says, as a descendant of David. Now, if you recall, when I started this series... Jesus talked about the regeneration happening in relation to him sitting on his throne of glory. This was in Luke's gospel, where Luke presents Jesus as the one who is to be given the throne of David. Luke is presenting Jesus as part of the Davidic lineage, which 
identifies Jesus as a king. And the Davidic lineage was the biological lineage from which all other kings came through Israel. In the first creation, according to the flesh. Paul further amplifies this idea of what it means to be born after the flesh when he writes to the Galatians. He says Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law. Uh, So, after the flesh is biology, yes, and that genealogy of begatting, yep. But it's more than that. After the flesh is the human self as source, not just with the human being able to begat and generate and have children, not just that, it includes that. But it also was for Paul being born under the law because that is where self as source is required to do something. That's why it's called the requirements of the law. There were requirements that had to be met from the self. And those requirements would either be met or not, so you would either be found obedient or disobedient. That was the paradigm. And the law was meant to separate those who were obedient from those who were disobedient. It had a legitimate role and function, as law does today. So, Jesus is born into the first creation, and this first creation is also referred to by Paul as all in Adam. And further, Paul says, all in Adam are dead. This is a creation built on separation paradigms and separation thinking. So, this separation defining aspect of Adam goes all the way back to the attempt by Adam to see himself as separate from God. And that is because through his instinctive self as source, his survival self, he attempted to gain as much power as he could and therefore for him in the realm of self, His attempt was to be like God. If you're like God, you're certainly not needing to be dependent on God. And his self as source was an attempt to be like God. And that attempt to be like God was the the advent, the inbreaking of sin. That was the sin of Adam to attempt to achieve and maintain his own God identity. Through doing, through grasping, grasping that fruit. Well, Jesus was identified at his birth with Adam, with that creation. But at the same time, Paul is going to explain to the Gentiles that Jesus was the last Adam. So, This being the case, this is also going to be the last of death and sin, which came through Adam. No one today can be an Adam because Christ was the one to take that lineage or genealogy of identity and put it to death. He was the last of it. He put it to death. He was dying to what? He was dying to doing. He was dying to doing. He was dying to self as source. You can't be an Adam today. Adam doesn't exist. The only thing that exists today is the second identity after the spirit and the new creation. There is no former creation. There is no Adam This is something Paul's trying to explain to the Gentiles, and it doesn't go down easy because, man, does that violate my ego. How in the world can someone else have God identity when they haven't done what I have done? 
How's this even possible? The Gentiles certainly didn't believe it. That's why Paul's writing them the letter, as we'll see as we continue to go along. So, yes, back to Romans 1, Jesus was born in Adam, after the flesh, under the law, unified with an Adam identity. However, Paul goes on to say, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God. Oh, he's getting back into genealogy, isn't he? Jesus was declared to be Son of God, not through the Adam creation, not through selfish source. He was declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit. Their second identity, after the flesh, after the Spirit, what Paul says is, how is Jesus the Son, how does one have the identity of child of God? When God is the source or Spirit is the source. He was declared according to the Spirit by His resurrection from the dead. Jesus died as part of the dead creation. He died and went to the tomb, but here's the difference. He wasn't identified with that. He did not remain in the grave with the Adam identity he was born into. He put that identity to death so he could be regenerated. And the power of the regeneration of Jesus was the power of God's Spirit that raised him from the dead. The faith of Jesus was that he would allow the self, to be crucified, that he would go to the tomb in that state of deadness to death, completely believing that God and only God could give life from the dead. And so that was the power of his resurrection was the power of God's action. Jesus wasn't declared to be son until God, as source, resurrected him into that status. And that was the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ and what the cross was about was Jesus was dying to doing. He didn't see the cross as a requirement for him to achieve identity. He already believed The Father and I are one. He already believed that. What he was dying to was the thought that a person had to do something in order to be one with God. So here you got the Gentiles, and they thought that they had God identity because they had been baptized into Christ. The Gentiles were saying, didn't Jesus die for the sins of the world? Isn't that what we're all about? says the Gentile body, that Jesus died for everybody's sins. Now we've been baptized into Jesus, and that's the end of the story. And here's the problem. Disobedient Israel has not. The rest of the world has not. They have not done what we have done. And here's what Jesus is all about. Jesus is a new requirement, and we've met it. Baptism is a new requirement. And we've met it. We were baptized into Christ. Christ died, and that was the end of the story with regard to sin. And so we're saved. Israel is not. Disobedient Israel is not. But Paul and the apostles had to stress constantly through the first century to the tribal instinctive self of all the followers of Jesus, that sin and death was a doing problem and that Jesus was the foundation of putting that to death, putting that away. But the body was also a necessary part of the story. They themselves were supposed to be imitating Christ as part of God's revelation 
of what after the Spirit was. This is why Paul says to them, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. But wasn't Jesus already, didn't he already die for everybody's sin? Isn't that it? Jesus, the individual, all we need is the individual. The individual is the end of everything. Jesus, the individual, died for our sins. End of story. If that's the case, then why did Paul say your salvation is nearer than when you first believed? Why did Peter say, we are waiting for the salvation that's about to be revealed? Why did the writer of Hebrews say, God is in the process of removing the first that he might remove, that he might establish the second, that new covenant, from which there is this new creation? So the writer says, the first is growing old, and it's ready to disappear. But Jesus already died on the cross. The rest of the story is the collective Christ. The body can't be separated from the head. I've said that many times. Paul's trying to say, Gentiles, understand, you have died with Christ. Okay, that's step one. You are now dead with Christ. That's not the end of the process. You have died with Christ that you might be. That's a future subjective in the text, in the Greek text. That you might be in the likeness of his resurrection. Just like Paul said that all Israel will be, future tense, saved. Salvation was future beyond the cross. The defeat of sin and death was beyond the cross. The deliverer coming out of Zion was beyond the cross. The coming of a new creation was beyond the cross. The coming of a new paradigm that was not separation thinking was beyond the cross. And what the Gentiles didn't understand was they were supposed to be modeling. They had died to requirements. And they were doing the opposite. They were actually establishing a new religion based on different requirements, but still based on requirements. Instead of their death being death to doing, to model after the Spirit is that God was regenerating the world, reconciling the world, restoring all things, being the only founder of the new covenant, etc., etc. They were instead regressing into first creation thinking, separation thinking based on, here's what we did, here's what they did not. So that's the problem he's got. It's natural, it's tribal. Christianity was being established as a new tribe. And so the Gentiles were struggling with this, and Paul had to turn that thinking around to say to them, God's the source, God's the source. So you have to understand, Gentiles, this process is both dying and rising. I mentioned, for example, this confusing passage about that we'll get to in 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks about, well, then why... Why be baptized for the dead on behalf of the dead? What's Paul talking about? This is, this is something that becomes very confusing. Well, baptism was the way they were baptized into his death. What did he die to? He died to doing. Well, how does resurrection happen? Who's going to be raised? The dead. You're being baptized as a model of God's raising the dead. You are saying that your faith is the faith of Christ, that you believe you are no longer defined by your doing, and you are living a life of death to that. In anticipation of the deliverer coming and proving your point that your identity is purely from the Spirit, and if that is so, then all identity is from the Spirit. The resurrection process is completed with the resurrection of the dead. So I might say this as far as the trajectory, trying to, you know, outline this, explain this. Here's the process. First, 
you have the individual Christ. Everything always starts with me, the individual. That is true. First and foremost, it's about me, the individual. First and foremost. But I'm not just an individual. That's what the biblical narrative says with regard to the process of identity. My identity is not just me, the individual. You have a firstborn one. That's Jesus. Then you have firstborn ones. That was what the role and function of the body was in the first century. The body was representing the firstborn ones. What comes after the body of firstborn ones? The reconciliation of the world, the resurrection of all the dead. So here's the process. Jesus is the firstborn one from the dead. The followers of Jesus baptized into his death were the firstborn ones from the dead in anticipation of the resurrection of the dead, which is the totality of humanity for the totality of humanity was being regenerated with regard to identity. But the Gentiles didn't see it that way. The Gentiles were saying, oh my, no, how can you say that, Paul? Well, they haven't met any of the re requirements. And of course, Paul has already gone to great length to say, hey, I didn't meet any of the requirements either. God stopped me in my tracks and took me through a process where he reconciled and restored me. It wasn't because I answered the altar call. It wasn't because what I did. I didn't say the creedal statement or keep the dogma. And this is what you Gentiles are not understanding. God's bigger than what you're telling people. Christ's work is so much more than what you're telling the world. What you're doing as Gentiles is you are beginning to tell the story of God and Christ as a separation paradigm. Talk more about that in a second here. Now, Paul was addressing the same problem to the Gentiles in Corinth. You go to 1 Corinthians 15. What was the problem? Paul's concern was that they were saying, there's no resurrection of the dead. And Paul is wondering, how can you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? So Paul says this to them. If the dead don't rise, then Christ is not risen. What, what does he mean? Paul is saying, Jesus was raised from Adam Jesus was raised purely by the power of God from Adam. Adam represents the dead. Who are the dead in Adam? All. What's the resurrection work of God about? All. All raised. All dead, all raised. In Christ. Yeah, what is Christ? Christ the individual and Christ the body. What were they Modeling. What was their role and function? To model that they had died to requirements and to doing. And so he says, if the dead are not raised, then Christ isn't raised because Christ took on the identity of Adam and every person that was in Adam. Jesus became like his brothers. That's how he became like them. He took on the same identity because he was born into that identity and was identified by that type of genealogical thinking. But he became son through that which God did. God did not leave Jesus in the tomb as all others in Adam had experienced. This was different. All others in Adam died in Adam, and that was the end of the story up until Jesus. And then the God story transcends the first initial understanding of identity. 
the second covenant transcends the covenant that brought the initial first creation understanding, because this is a growing up process. So he says all of that, and he says that the faith of Jesus was that God was the source, not Adam. And then he says to the Corinthian Gentiles, he says, if Christ is not raised, the dead are not raised. Your faith, Gentiles, is now futile. Why? Because you made your faith a work. If this is the case, guys, that it's something that that your baptism into Christ is a requirement, then your faith is now futile. And you are yet in your sin. Why? Because sin is all about the human doing in order to achieve and maintain God identity. It sounds so right to the egoic self. This is part of the series I did on the deceitfulness of good. So, baptism was death to self, death to doing. Don't go back into that first creation identity. What was resurrection? It was nothing less than the coming of the deliverer to deliver one from that first creation paradigm. The defeat of sin came from the removal of the first creation covenant adjudicated by law, and law was for the purpose of separating on the basis of good and evil the very first thing that Adam tried to grasp as a human through self as source. And what Paul was saying to the Gentiles was, you do understand that when you, when you come together on the first day of the week and you celebrate this thing called Eucharist, communion, etc., you're doing it until Christ comes. You are showing or remembering what? His death. The body, the entire first century, the body was a chosen generation to show they had, by faith, become dead with Christ, and by faith expected the Deliverer to come from Zion and bring them into a new creation, thereby regenerating their identity. Paul was trying to correct a message of Gentile separatism. The Gentiles were making a religion or form out of Christ. Whereas God's work in Christ was to reconcile the world. The Gentiles were making a form or religion that was to first separate all others outside the walls of that body. Rather than that body being a modeling on behalf of all the dead, It became an exclusive body that separated itself from the dead by what they did. So this message by the Gentiles, people say, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Why didn't people get it back then? Why did the Gentiles pass this message down? Why then did that same thinking turn into the religion found initially in Rome? Why is it that we end up with a message of Jesus that says, well, there's us Baptists and those Methodists, us Presbyterians, those Catholics, us Mormons and those Jehovah Witnesses, us Amish, those Pentecostalists, how did all that happen? How in the world did we get to where we are today? This is why I'm 
have gone through in the past in such great detail the model of spiral dynamics. If you sit there and say, boy, they messed up the message 2,000 years ago. I can't believe how they messed up that message. They should have understood that 2,000 years ago. I can't believe God let all this happen. Oh, why didn't God just send Jesus after Adam? God let a lot of stuff happen. God let a lot of stuff happen before there was even Israel. And then once there was Israel, God let a lot of stuff happen. He let temple happen and priesthood. He let animal sacrifices happen. God let a lot of stuff happen. This is why we're saying what Paul said. You have to understand it's about growing up from childhood to adulthood. That's what Paul said. You have to understand it's, it's moving from milk to meat. That's what the writer of Hebrews said. That's growing up language. We're still growing up and always will grow up. That's the story of the narrative. But the ego wants a terminal place. Why can't we just get to this place? And then what? So what was happening was the Gentiles were receiving the message of Jesus and the apostles. And they were doing so coming from a blue traditional world of law where separation was the main message. And think about the Rome, the, the Roman and Corinthians and all these people. You're talking about the understanding they had of God and God's coming into this was that you had to appease the gods. You had to avoid the wrath of the gods, the vengeful actions of the gods. And so now here's another god. And they're interpreting Jesus as the messenger of this new god who looks like what they think God is. And so because law was one of the primary values of their day that had come into being because the previous era of history was the warrior age when there was nothing but chaos, and that's why law became a value, highly valued element of their society. They just simply took it into the teachings of Jesus, and because it was law-based, new words came into being like creed and dogma. And the question is, have you kept the creed? Have you properly interpreted the dogma? Have you stayed inside the boundaries of what we will define as a Christian religion person versus those who are not part of the Christian religion? It is a repeat of first creation separation thinking that's been handed down. Now, we've also seen that when modernity came, the message got blown up into thousands of Protestant churches and denominations. That's a, that's a creation built on begatting, that Christianity begat this domination, this denomination, this denomination. It's a begatting message, and it keeps dividing. And so then you get into postmodernity where we are now. And so what we try to do is relativize Christ. We put Christ on the bumper sticker as a world religion, Christianity. And instead of being critical or saying anything other than we should get along with all other religions, we say coexist. This is how we've grown. I'm just saying this is how we've grown. I'm not condemning it because this is how we've grown. This is, this is how you grow up as a person. The things you think as a little child are not the things you think as you get older. It's just the way growth works. And if you want to argue with history, argue with history. Say it shouldn't be. Say reality shouldn't be reality. Say it shouldn't be this way. And then tell the world, by the way, I've got it right. And go on with your separation paradigm. So one of the things that I'll leave it with before I continue next week, because there's a lot of other elements that are playing it out, but here's the way that I would leave it today in terms of the way this Bible message 
is so vitally important in terms of continued conversation. The war in Ukraine, the challenges of discrimination in my country and in other countries where you may be listening, discrimination based on male-female or gender as in LGBTQ or class, every single one of these things that are occurring on the planet come from separation thinking. So I'll leave with, with these questions. What if the answer to our world's problems lies in the last pay, place we would ever think to look? What if the world's largest religion is at a point in history where it needs to look within its own house? Why are there so many denominations? Why has this become a message that creates separation? Why are so many churches dying and so many seminaries struggling? Paul told the Gentiles, if you hold on to first creation identity, it will manifest condemnation. If you try to identify yourself through the law, through keeping requirements of some kind, that's going to minister unto death and it's going to minister to condemnation. So the last question I'll leave us with today as I continue in the next one is this. If that's what the first creation produces, isn't it time that we should stop telling the story of the God of condemnation and instead tell the story of the God of reconciliation and restoration. A lot more to say about this and continue the discussion. Feel free to keep sending me your emails and uh, I'll look forward, to, look forward to seeing you the next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at info at presence.tv. You can also visit our website at presence.tv or find us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you.